Welcome everyone. Let's talk about pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is blockage. Difficulty in breathing and chest pain in a patient with existing leg pain lung. is characteristic Mostly of pulmonary embolism. When a blood clot travels pulmonary to the embolism lung starts from as a deep vein, vein thrombosis in the, in the legs. A patient having when a clot breaks off and travels up to the arteries the of the lungs, it becomes travel a pulmonary the embolism. Circulation going Typical the symptoms are chest pain and pulmonary arteries leading to pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is a common life-threatening condition that difficulty in breathing and chest pain. Most patients with pulmonary embolism have shortness of breath or tachypnea, increase in the respiratory rate more than 20. Although absence of these features does not reliably exclude the diagnosis, but the classic clinical features which are usually present are pleuritic chest pain. Patients have increasing chest pain with breathing, shortness of breath, tachypnea, tachycardia, hemoptysis if the patient has uh, ischemia of the lung, mild fever, cyanosis, elevated GVP. Elevated GVP is a bad sign. It means that there is a large thrombus. What are the risk factors to get a pulmonary embolism? So according to the British Thoracic Guideline, they say that major risk factors for venous thromboembolism, whether DVT or pulmonary embolism, is due to recent immobility, major surgery, lower limb trauma or surgery, pelvic uh, uh, pregnancy or post postpartum, major medical illness, any illness that leading to admission more than three days, previous proven venous thromboembolic events. When you want to uh, diagnose a case, you have to sc having a well score. Uh, this is for pre-test probability of the pulmonary embolism. So you will collect the point. Is if the patient have clinical signs and symptoms of DVT, they will get three point. If the uh, patient have pulmonary embolism, is the first differential diagnosis or equally likely, they also get three. For example, if the patient is suspected to, to be having pneumonia, uh, but you want to exclude pulmonary embolism, but there is all signs of pneumonia, you have to uh, not give three to the patient. But if there is no any other differential diagnosis uh, apart from pulmonary embolism, or pulmonary embolism is mostly uh, most suspicion, suspicious one, then they get three. Heart rate more than 100, 1.5, Immobilization at least three days or surgery in the previous four weeks, 1.5. Previous objectively diagnosed for pulmonary embolism or DV, previous objectively diagnosed pulmonary embolism DVT, 1.5. Hemoptysis 1. Malignancy or treatment within the six months or palliative, uh, they will get 1. So if the scoring is 4, it, less than 4, it means 3, 2, 1. So the, it means that pulmonary embolism is unlikely. If four and more, uh, uh, pulmonary embolism is likely. Why this is important? Because you want to send a test called D-dimer. So when you send D-dimer test for these patients, for patients who are unlikely, you send the D-dimer. If it is positive, you say you have to do Doppler ultrasound uh, or you do pulmonary angiography in order to diagnose. But negative test, it excludes the problem. It excludes pulmonary embolism. While for pulmonary embolism score four and more, uh, the patient should not have a D-dimer test. They don't need the dimer Directly you go to the uh, pul pulmonary angiography. The investigations for pulmonary embolism are D-dimer, as we say, D-dimer not to be used as a routine screening test. It should only be performed after you have done a, uh, after you have done the well score and the patient is having a low probability test. When the patient have low clinical probability test and a negative D-dimer, it can exclude pulmonary embolism uh, in this group. Another test is ECG. It's very important to know that 
most of the ECGs, they have sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia is the most common one. Also, patients could have atrial fibrillation, right bundle branch block, right axis division, right ventricular strain. So all of them, they are right because of because the pulmonary embolism comes out from the right ventricle. Sometimes um, we have a pattern called S1Q3T3, means there is deep S in, in lead 1, and uh, in lead 3 there will be Q wave, Q wave, and there will be T inversion. So if the patient having these features, uh, it is mostly pulmonary embolism, but only 10% of patients have this change. And many other patients could be having normal ECG. Okay, chest X-ray. Chest X-ray usually normal in pulmonary embolism. So, Sometimes it might show some um, pulmonary oligemia or elevated hemidiaphragm. Uh, but usually you have to do chest X-ray in order to find a, an alternative diagnosis. For example, you are suspecting PE. But when you do the uh, chest X-ray, you find a pneumonia or pneumothorax, then you change your mind. CT pulmonary angiography. CT pulmonary angiography is the gold standard for the diagnosis. If the patient have in, in low probability test, in low probability test, if positive D-dimer, you have to do this test immediately. If the patient have high probability, it means the scoring of a well is more or equal to four, then directly go ahead with the CT pulmonary. Don't do D-dimer. Leg ultrasound is important as a, a lung, uh, it's an alternative to lung imaging, especially those who are pregnant. Uh, you don't want to expose them to CT scan. So instead you do a um, Doppler ultrasound. If the patient have Doppler ultrasound of the leg, if they have DVT, then you treat uh, the uh, DVT, the treatment of DVT and pulmonary embolism is the same in hemodynamically stable patient. Isotope lung scanning, now they not done, but usually uh, it's provided if uh, a patient have normal chest X-ray and no chronic cardiac or respiratory disease. If the diagnosis is equivocal following the VQ scan, then you have to do a CT pulmonary angiography. Of course, for a VQ scan, uh, and CT pulmonary angiography, usually there should be, uh, as, um, you have to talk with the mother uh, who is pregnant because in VQ scan have more risk to the child uh, while CT pulmonary angiography has more risk to the uh, mother, to the breast of the mother. So um, you have to ask them before doing that test. Echocardiography. Why echocardiography? Echocardiography is useful in unstable patient. If there is massive pulmonary embolism, if there is a massive pulmonary embolism, there will be right ventricular dilatation. Thrombo, uh, thrombophilia screening, only recommended in patients under 50 with recurrent pulmonary embolism, so uh, less than 50 age, uh, and strong family history. It should not be measured acutely because thrombus can distort the result. So you don't do it in the emergency department, you do it later. IBG um, usually is good to assess the ventilation, ventilation of the patient, but not very useful to include or exclude pulmonary embolism as a diagnosis. What's the treatment of pulmonary embolism? Treatment is giving oxygen if the patient is hypoxic, okay? Then you have to give, uh, if the patient is stable, if the patient is stable, you have to give a low molecular weight heparin or a new anticoagulants like apixaban or rivaroxaban, or even you give low molecular weight heparin. So apixaban, 10 milligram orally, twice daily for seven days, then five milligram twice daily. Uh, you don't need to remember this dose too much in exams, but you have to know that uh, apixaban is a new novel anticoagulant. It does not need to monitor INR frequently. Rivaroxaban is the same. is a novel anticoagulant, 50 mg by 2, twice daily, then, uh, for 21 days, for 3 weeks. Then 20 mg, 1 by 1. A low molecular weight heparin, 
usually we use it in the emergency department. What we use is usually we use enoxaparin, which is called clexin. For pulmonary embolism, the dose is 150 units per kg once daily. For example, if the patient is 60 kg, you have to give 9,000 units once daily. Or, if it's not suitable, you can give 100 units twice daily per kg. For example, if the patient is 60, you give 6,000 units twice daily. For unfractionated heparin, conventional heparin, it's used in circumstances where uh, the patient um, uh, as, a, as an initial first dose due to its quicker onset in uh, some patients. If you need rapid, rapid reversal uh, or, or if there is massive pulmonary embolism, you have to give 5,000 units IV bolus, then 1,300 uh, units per hour continuous infusion. Anyhow, it is used in some patients like those with renal failure because of risk of bleeding. What is massive pulmonary embolism? Massive pulmonary embolism is there when the patient is having collapse, sudden loss of consciousness, or they have hypotension, not responding to fluid, unexplained hypoxia, engorged neck venous, or right ventricular gallop um, on auscultation. So if the patient have engorged neck venous, collapse and hypotension, these things is, it means that the pulmonary embolism is very big. It obstructs all the artery or two arteries. So what is treatment for mass pulmonary embolism? You directly go ahead with the thrombolysis. What thrombolysis we give? Usually we give um, altiplase. It is the first line treatment in massive pulmonary embolism and it may be instituted on the clinical grounds only if the cardiac arrest is imminent. So if the patient is very tired, you are suspecting pulmonary embolism highly, so you, you give thrombolysis. CT pulmonary angiography and echocardiography will reliably diagnose clinically massive pulmonary embolism if the patient is condition permit. So if the patient um, is more stable, you can do a, a echo at least. So dose of altiplase is usually 100 milligram in stable patient with confirmed diagnosis. If unstable, you only give 50 milligram, then uh, you repeat the dose after the diagnosis. Thrombolysis is followed by unfractionated heparin only after three hours. So anyhow, you have to know that altiplase is used for massive pulmonary embolism. Uh, other uses of altiplase, we usually give it for um, ST elevation MI when become delayed more than two hours or for patients with stroke. Sometimes mechanical embolectomy can be done um, through a catheter which is directed to the pulmonary artery. Venous thromboembolism in pregnancy is 10 times more common in pregnant women than non-pregnant at the same age. It can occur at any stage of the pregnancy, but the purpurium, it means after delivery, is the time of highest risk. When you suspect a DVT in a pregnant lady, low molecular weight heparin should be started at once uh, and the DVT, uh, once the DVT is suspected and continued until the diagnosis is achieved. A D-dimer test is usually not recommended. It doesn't give you a clue because most of them, they have a positive D-dimer. Compre compression duplex uh, ultrasound is the investigation of choice for patients with suspect uh, ultrasound. So you have to do a Doppler ultrasound. If DVT is confirmed uh, and the patient, sh uh, the patient should continue on low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparin does not cross the placenta while warfarin is teratogenic and should, be, should not be prescribed in pregnant patients. But it is safe during a breastfeeding period. For pulmonary embolism, if, it, uh, if pulmonary embolism is suspected in a pregnant lady, you have to do a chest x-ray to exclude uh, other problems like pneumonia, pneumothorax, lower collapse, because the radiation of the chest x-ray to a fetus at, this, at any stage of pregnancy is negligible. So you don't afraid from chest x-ray. A, a simple chest x-ray in a pregnant lady can exclude many problems. 
In the chest x-ray, uh, if the chest x-ray is normal, then you have to do Doppler ultrasound. If Doppler ultrasound is positive, you treat as if the other patient is having pulmonary embolism because the treatment is the same. And if the Doppler ultrasound is normal, is if the Doppler ultrasound is positive and the patient have clinical features of pulmonary embolism, you don't need to expose the patient to radiations to CT pulmonary angiography. Women should be involved in the decision of whether they undergo CT pulmonary angiography or VQ scan. As we said, CT pulmonary angiography has more risk to the, uh, to the, to the mother, while VQ scan have more risk to the baby. Treatment with non-molecular rotiparin should be commenced to pulmonary embolism in pregnancy until the diagnosis is reached. If a pulmonary embolism is confirmed, then you have to continue the treatment with non-molecular retiparin. So key point is venous thromboembolism, embolic disease, represents a spectrum that includes DVT and pulmonary embolism. All patients with possible venous thromboembolism should have clinical probability assessment by well score and then documented. Um, uh, the most commonly used risk stratification for pulmonary embolism is well score. Uh, the D-dimer is a marker of endogenous fibrinolysis. It is sensitive but not specific marker for, of, uh, for VTE. A D-dimer should only be considered after assessment of clinical probability. It should not be used as a screening test. Patients with suspected VTE, you should start low molecular weight heparin until you do a confirmative diagnosis, for example, after 24-48 hours. Massive PE is likely in patients with collapse, hypotension, and explained hypoxia, engorged neck vein or right ventricular collapse. Gallop. Thrombolysis or alteplase is the first line treatment in the massive pulmonary embolism, and it may be instituted on clinical grounds only if the patient has imminent cardiac arrest. And thank you.